we're here. Um, we're nearly to the end. We're doing uh, the Windows Registry today. There's a guest lecture next week and um, just a couple more classes. Oh, by the way, um, Irvin Lemus needs volunteers for a conference that's coming up. Um, uh, it, there is a conference, a Pacific Hackers Conference. He needs people to volunteer on Friday. This is in uh, Palo Alto or somewhere around, somewhere down south. And I don't think I'm delivering a workshop, I think, because I couldn't do it because I had to go to CPCC. But if anybody wants to volunteer to this, um, you should, uh, I guess, uh, let me know here in class is probably the best thing to do. Irvin didn't give me any way to have you contact you. He said, need some students to help him, um, and he'll get you in for free at this conference. Yeah, so let me know if anybody's interested in doing that, and I'll put you in contact with Irvin. Um, as you see, it's about a week away. It's worth extra credit if you care about that. I'm sure you'll see doing good things there. Anyway, um, all right. So let's take a look at the registry. Uh, oh, by the way, the final grades are up. If you look on Canvas, I mean, the final grades, the final grade chart is up. So you can see how many points you need for every letter grade. So um, people have been asking for that. So you can calculate, you know, how much more you have to do to get an A and so on. All right. So we're going to talk about the registry today and other things next time. So the Windows Registry replaces the text files that were used by MS-DOS to contain settings like win.ini and autoexec.bat. This is all the configuration data for Windows Operating System and applications. It's a large binary database and a reservoir of enormous amount of information useful for forensics. Uh, in true Microsoft form, it is not stored in any logical way at all. It is not even contained in one file. It's not even contained in any fixed number of files. It's files scattered all over the place that are loaded. Um, five main hives are in System32 config. These are the main ones, System Security, Software, SAM, and Default. SAM is Security Accounts Manager, and that's where passwords hashes are. And then each user's profile directory, when a user account is created on a Windows machine, in the user's folder, there's a folder created with your username, and a bunch of files are immediately created the first time you log in. And the most important one for us is ntuser.dat. There's another one in there called userclass.dat. The ntuser.dat is actually the most useful. All these other hives contain um, machine settings that affect the whole machine, like the time zone and the Windows operating system and such. But all the personal data goes in ntuser.dat, and that's usually what you want. You want to know what an individual did. And so this ntuser.dat for that user is where you'll find most of the goodies. When you log into a system, there are, um, right, so when you first connect, it creates a profile for your user. It does it by copying the default profile, which is there for that purpose. And then you customize it by putting things on your desktop, changing your start menu, installing applications, resizing windows, and all those things go in ntuser.dat. So these things that look like folders in regedit are keys. These are values, and that's the data. Um, so here's the five root keys that are the root of the machine, and they do not tie in any way to those five root hive files. There's nothing that logical about it at all, but these are the five root keys. They're not even five independent objects. So um, each key users contains the default key to go to the default hive, which is the default setup for newly created users. Then every user has their own each key user subkey by their security identifier. The security identifier is a 128-bit object that is used to uniquely identify. Actually, I'm not, this one, not, not 128 bits. This one here is actually a lot like, uh, like Linux. It's a long number referring to the machine followed by a dash and then a number that says what user you are. And just like in Linux, I think the first newly created user is 1000 and 1001, 1002, and so on. So that's your unique identifier, security identifier, and that maps to your ntuser.dat hive file. And then there's userclass.dat also. So the, um, Many of these five root hives are in fact just shortcuts pointing to another root hive. Like H key current user just points to H key the current user's SID. So remember back up here, there were two of them. There's H key current user and H key users. This just points to a subfolder of that. Uh, sub key, I guess they'd call it. And, uh, and current config just points, I think, to this, a sub key of this one. So it's, uh, it's a very strange structure. 
uh, current control set points to a subset of the HKEY local machine to the control set you're using. The control set is the hardware set. Microsoft has had this for a long time where you could, in principle, boot up your machine with different hardware. And you could have like a docking station. So sometimes it has one monitor and sometimes it has a different one. And it stores those in hardware profiles so it knows what drivers to load. And they go in here as control sets. And the current control set is the one that was detected when it most recently boot up, booted up. All right, and HKEY classes root, by the way, merges two subkeys, so it remains uh, sort of mind-bogglingly twisted the way Microsoft stuff usually is. It all seems like it was designed by a board of directors at a corporation or something. Anyway, um, the time, there's only one timestamp stored on a key, last right time. It doesn't, it changed supposedly when any value is added or removed, but not when subkeys are removed, and in fact, it's not maintained very well. It gets... Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, C program files, VMware here, look at the run keys. These are things that will automatically run. You'll find they all have the same write time because it'll just update the run key as a global object. You cannot tell when these things were added from dates in the time in the registry. And also, it often updates them all at once during like a reboot. It doesn't update them promptly when you take an action. So these registry timestamps are not worth very much. And this is... Uh, Reminder, whenever you're doing uh, forensics, you always have to test on a test system to find out what the artifacts mean, because they often don't mean as much as you think. And then, of course, there's the issue we talked about before, um, reflection and redirection. If you run 32-bit code on a 64-bit system, Microsoft uses the reflection and redirection process to make that 32-bit process believe it's running on a 32-bit machine. So if it tries to make registry changes, they're redirected to the subsystem to alternate registry keys like wow, 6432 node. So they think they're changing the registry, but they're just changing this extra registry, which is the registry seen by 32-bit programs. And that means that 32-bit forensic software can't see the whole registry, and it means that 32-bit software cannot mess up the 64-bit registry. And so you've got system configuration, shim cache, auto run, and user hive. These are important types of keys to look at. So the system configuration includes basic information like the computer name, the Windows version, and the time zone. And you see these are not tied to one user account. They're just an H key local machine. So they take effect before you log in and uh, they're general information that is not tied to one user account. Installed applications, mounted devices, USB store. This is actually quite useful. Uh, the reason my, the registry has to record every USB device is so it knows what, what um, drivers to load, but it does have a temporal record of what USB devices have been connected. So when you're doing a criminal forensic examination, this is the first place you look because you did, got a court order to examine the machine, and then you look in USB store, you find out what USB devices have been attached, and then you immediately contact your client and say, you better have another court order seizing these devices. While I investigate this, there's more stuff you should seize because these devices were attached to this machine and they should therefore logically be examined. Anyway, um, you got network information showing wireless networks and shares and what uh, adapter setups, audit policies, group membership, and so on. All right, and then the shim cache. A shims is, again, for Microsoft backward compatibility, which is a huge feature of Windows. Windows lets you run programs written for earlier versions of Windows. And in order to do that, it has extensive compatibility features. So you can launch some program designed for Windows 98, and it will try to create an environment so that program will run under a modern version of Windows. This is the application compatibility cache, so it will have... Um, special compatibility settings for everything you execute. And they will record the last modified date and when it was actually run. Um, so the, it keeps records to remember how to uh, adjust the setting, the configuration to make this application run. And that coincidentally creates artifacts that are useful. And so here's the shim cache. It's in system current control set way down here, app compat cache. It's maintained in memory while you're running it, and when you shut down, it records it, saying, okay, these seem to be the settings you like, and it maintains 1,024 entries, which is more than prefetch, which only has 128. It also includes apps that have not executed yet, so that can be useful. And uh, so here it shows there's a tool you can use called Shim Cache Parser. It's one of the many tools that will automatically find it and import the, uh, the data in a re readable form, so you get a nice list. On uh, this date, this thing was launched. What Apparently, apps that have not been executed yet, if they've been installed but never run yet, they'll still appear in the shim cache. That's my understanding of it, although I haven't tested it. All right. 
Let's try a Kahoot. 12B1. There it is. And that's another thing which, you know, I would test before I would, uh, I would go testify in court about that. I would install something, not run it, and look in the shim cache to understand what's stored there. But I guess it stores some kind of uh, settings that it figures out during installation. That would be my guess, but I'm not sure exactly how it works. Trump even contacted Dr. Oz and said, just claim victory. Don't, don't give up. He just ignored him and, and conceded, which is what happened to him on January 6th, too. He told Republicans to go along with this, and they just didn't go along with it. There are American traditions that the Republicans have not yet abandoned. There is no enforcement, but there's a bunch of traditions, and there are, many Republicans are not really willing to go along with him. They say they are, but they aren't really going to go all the way. Yes, and that's another. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes, and that's a big step, according to the experts. When you corrupt the court system, that's a big step towards autocracy. When the courts just let the, the leader do anything, whether it's legal or not. And that's what he wants, but he doesn't really have it. The Supreme Court went against him a few times. So we'll see. Anyway. Uh, all right, I'll give it. I'll wait for the music to come around to see if anybody else wants to join. Apparently not. Oh, in fact, they're leaving. <laughs> I'll wait a few seconds to see if somebody's coming back. If you only have three, it's a little silly. That's right. Oh, there we are. Now, we're, well, somebody's got a bad connection. It's, it's you, huh? Let's see if you can get in. We're not in a hurry. Yeah, yeah, well, this, yeah, I, I oh, a couple, good, good, we waited, a couple people made it, all right, let's give it a shot. All right, so which hive file has several instances on a Windows computer? Yep, that's right, the others are system, one for the whole system, but this one has one for every user, NT user. All right. Which one is not included in a captured hard disk image? Ah, uh, good. I wonder, this one's a little bit hard. The current control set is not stored on the disk anywhere. It's stored in just the uh, system hive for all the controls. The only way to find out which one is current is to look for a special key. So, um, it's, uh, anyway, the current control set is not stored on the disk, and you won't find it in a captured registry. All the control sets are there, but the special one called current control set is not distinguished from the others. All right. Anyway, um, all right. So where do you find up to 128 programs recently? That's the prefetch. We talked about it before. So it can preload them into memory to make performance better. Unfortunately, they are not tied to the user accounts. You know when they were launched and how many times they were launched, but you don't know which users launched them. All right, and which one is only on 64-bit systems? And that's the one, of course, kind of obvious. This is the one that lets you run 32-bit code on your 64-bit system. All right. So, oh, there you go. Good thing you might get connected.
Alright. Show me that. Tell me who they are if they care about punch, but they may not. Alright. Alright, so let's take a look at some more of this glorious registry stuff. So, um, the auto runs are ones that give you persistence, so your um, program will automatically launch when you reboot the system. These are called auto start extensibility points, and there are hundreds of them. Uh, some still undocumented. And they'll load when you boot or when you log in or at other times. Services are the most common way to do it. Services a launch and run in the background. Most of them run before you log in, so they run under one of the system accounts that is there. Um, some of them run after you log in, but most of them run before you log in. And they're mostly DILs, by the way, because they provide a bunch of entry points. They provide functions for programs to use. They're support for programs. So um, you're in the find in the registry. Each service has its own sub key here in the each key local machine down to the services, and that'll tell you the display name, the path, how it will start, and the type of service. And it uses this key to launch them uh, whenever the condition is set on how the service starts. Some of them launch automatically at boot up. Some of them do not launch until they're needed. So you'll find it here. Most of them are DILs. Um, you'll find a service DIL is one of the features you find here. They're usually launched by uh, and a service host.exe as loaded into the DIL, loaded as a DIL into service host.exe. Service control manager is this program. Services.exe is the graphical environment to look into it. And I think it's also just the executable that's running. That launches them on startup. You can examine, start and stop, and create them with the command line SC command, or in the GUI that you can launch the services control panel. Here's the SC command line. You can do a query for a WUA service and find out what it is, I think that's the Windows Update Authority, but I'm not quite sure. Um, and here's the GUI that you get by launching services that shows you a nice list of them. And as you see, some of these have started, some of them have not started. Um, only some start automatically, others don't. They start under other conditions, only when manually started or only when they're needed. One EXE can launch several services. You can see them in Process Manager, um, in Process monitor. You can see them. Um, Process Explorer. There, I finally got it right. Process Explorer. You can also do it from the command line with task list. So here's task list services, and you'll see this service host.exe is running that one. This is running a bunch of things. This one's running a whole bunch of things. This is the uh, one executable with all these dills loaded into it running services. And so here's some run keys. There are a lot of them. There's, this one is the most common one that runs every time you boot up. And there's other ones that run just once under various conditions. Uh, these will be, I think, when this user logs in. And this will be when you boot up. And there are many others. There's also something called Active Setup, which has um, lets you define something that will happen during setup. And the point of this, I think, is so you can manage programs by knowing where the installer is. As you, you can go into Microsoft, add or, you can go into Control Panel, add or remove programs, and you can reinstall things, uninstall them, and repair them. And I think it does that by knowing where the installers are here. All right. There's something called App Init Dills. And this is the idea that any application that links to user32.dil will load this, and this is in case you have a special keyboard or a special mouse or something. Anything that interacts with the user will have an opportunity to have extra libraries. So you could, the, all those uh, apps, and that's almost every app, any app that communicates with the user would load this. However, these AppInit dills are pretty much obsolete. They're no longer um, allowed since Windows 8 if you turn on Secure Boot, which is interesting. Secure Boot is not a Microsoft product. Secure Boot is on your motherboard. It's a UEFI boot up protocol. So many computers do not have Secure Boot. And this means, you know, certain kinds of hardware that uses this system would not run under Secure Boot conditions. So um, that's an interesting issue. But I guess that means most consumer machines are probably still using app init dills because I don't think very many machines have Secure Boot on. And uh, by the way, if you listen to the Paul's Security Weekly podcast, Paul is a huge expert on Secure Boot, and he often has a lot of analysis into the properties of Secure Boot. And there's even a Secure Boot virus going around, a serious flaw, you know, where you can actually infect the Secure Boot loader on machines. Uh, it's not exactly a virus, but it's a weakness on, I think, a whole class of machines. Um, and uh, that's something people have worried about for years. If you would infect the motherboard firmware, then no antivirus would save you. It would be hard to detect, hard to clean. Um, and 
there are some weaknesses being discovered and there are some attacks there, although I don't think there's a wide-spreading worm doing it because it would depend on your hardware, but still, that's been sort of one of the nightmares people have had for a long time. The LSA is the Local Security Authority, and this has authentication packages, um, and it, you can also launch malware with it. It's another system that loads on startup. What was the name of the podcast? It's Paul's Security Weekly. It's a really old one. been around for more than 10 years. Um, yep. And I'm, I'm posting them on my homepage now, the ones... Now that I'm in it, I would try and put them here, although I'm not sure I can. You've got on here, yeah, here's, here's mine, here's, here it is. In fact, here he is talking about driver signing. Uh, anyway, so I post a new one. It comes up once a week, and I try to keep the new one here. I think I didn't get a copy of the newest one. But anyway, you'll find it there. And there's also a live stream, uh, which I thought I put somewhere. Um, yeah, live stream here. You can listen to it live on Wednesday. Otherwise, I think it comes out on Fridays. Anyway, is boot hole the vulnerability? I don't know. I heard another name. Um, I wonder if I can find it. Uh, let's see what boot hole is. No, that's from nineteen. That's from twenty twenty. That in the grub boot hole. That's Linux. No, there's a there's a U there's a U fed uh, U uh, secure boot. There's a secure boot a flaw that's hit the news recently, and um, UEFI. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I think I it's in the news in the last few days. UEFI. Yep, there it is. A uh, UEFI firmware rootkit. I'll put the link in the chat. And there's also, and I think it infects only a certain brand of computers, uh, but I might be mixing it up with something else. Yep, Cosmic Strand, an unknown Chinese threat actor. Hey, this is one of them. Yep, anyway, there is UEFI malware. Yeah, it's, sure, it's good to know about. Anyway, let's see, let's figure out where we are. All right. So, uh, browser helper objects are the plugins for Internet Explorer. I do no longer support it in Edge, so I think this is probably not terribly relevant, unless you're still using Internet Explorer, which unfortunately a lot of corporations are. Um, then there are shell extensions. When you right-click something like an image and you have options, this is where you add those extra options, extra right context menus. So, for example, if you've installed 7-Zip, then it shows up here as 7-zip in a context menu handler. And then when you right-click on a file, there'll be a 7-zip option. So that's what these are, shell extensions. Then there's the WinLog on shell. This is what happens when you log on. Um, normally, you load explorer.exe, but you can make it load something else when you log on. And that's an old trick to get in machines. Um, well, actually, that's the one I know is the old one. before well, The one that loads before you log in is the exciting one. Uh, for the um, the handicapped accessibility feature. But anyway, this can, in principle, load something else other than the default shell, although I'm not aware of any reason why you would do that. And then there's user init. These are um, logon scripts that will run a script when you log on, and you can add additional um, executables to that value, another way to make things automatically launch when you log in. So if you want to find malicious auto runs, this is unfortunately very difficult. Um, you would like to think that you could spot them perhaps like spam by being spelled wrong or obviously suspicious, but unfortunately, some of, them, some of the malicious stuff is well written and doesn't have misspellings, and some of the official commercial stuff is poorly written and has suspicious features. So there's an example here. Um, here's HPDJ, something perhaps to do with HP. Here's IP RIP, looking for route updates. Here's RF alert, sending you alerts of monitored events. Monitored is spelled wrong. Here's um, something that allows your computer to share its keyboard called Synergy C. And, uh, you know, anybody remember, you know, I just read it in the book, any clue which one of these is wrong? I would say they all look kind of suspicious. This one has no description. And anyway, that's the point. You can't tell. It turns out three of these are legit. The one that's not legit is this one. The IP rip has an extra N in it here. But this one is spelled wrong. That's the way it really is. This one has no description. That's the way it really is and so on. That's the problem. You can't tell by that kind of clue, not very well at all. Yeah? Is there like a database of known good? That's a good question. Is there a database of known good things? That's essentially what any virus is. And um, in fact, uh, well, I mentioned something I know we talked about after class one time. There is a thing called um, Hijack This, which would help. Hijack This is a tool, um, although it may be, it hasn't been updated too much, but the point of hijack this is you can run a script to log to list all your 
processes, and this will tell you if any of them are not known. This is what you asked for. This is a list of all the known good processes to help you find the malicious processes. And so uh, it's very popular, although I'm not sure it is, it works. It's not, they say it's not able to properly generate the report for later ones. So now they say, um, I don't know what the modern equivalent is. This is only up to XP. So you have to find out what the modern equivalent, if there is such a thing. It would be nice because it is a very prominent problem that you have all this stuff running and how are you supposed to know the good stuff from the bad stuff. Here's what they recommend. Um, persistent binaries signed by trusted publishers. Those are probably okay. Um, persistent items created outside the time window of interest. That's right. If you have a time for your instant, that would help. Um, and examine the paths and then look to see if it's launching from a strange place. Uh, a legitimate thing is typically in a, a nested subdirectory like C, program, files, name of the company, bin or something. And attackers tend to launch it from the root of the system or temp or inside the trash can or someplace like that. That's a pretty good clue. It's suspicious. So that's somewhat useful, although, you know, not. Then, then you can take them, run the hashes and send them up to virus total. That's probably the best solution to be like you were saying. And then you can, the other thing to do, of course, is if you're working at a company and you have deployed from an image, then you'll have an original image. And you can see what binaries were not in your original image. That would be another clue. So that's a, some steps that would help narrow down trying to find the malicious ones. All right. And anyway, if you want to find these auto start programs, auto runs is by far the best program. This will launch all the things it can find that auto, it'll show you all the things that automatically load on your machine. Uh, it is not perfect, but it's the best tool available. Now, the original point of signatures is that you could trust signed code because it's signed by a company and you could sue them and put them out of business if they sell malware. And so that would be like a legal commitment that they're responsible for what they make. Uh, the problem is attackers have been stealing code signing signatures. So there has been some signed malware, but it's not very common. So a signature is a pretty good clue that something is uh, not malicious. Of course, it's not perfect, and even some legitimate things are not signed. Anyway, all right. None of these things are all that good, and we have an awful lot of discussions on Paul's Security Weekly about this. How much can you trust signatures, and how do you detect bad processes, and especially, how do you detect bad updates? And as far as I know, there is no good way to detect bad updates. This has been a big issue because of solar winds. Solar winds, the Russians hacked into the company and changed their updates so the legitimate signed updates were malicious. And how are you going to detect that? As far as I can tell, there's essentially no way. What are you going to do? Have your own team reverse engineer an update before you put on an update? That's sort of insane. You typically trust a company. The official update from the company, you tend to trust it. You test it to see if it works, but you don't test it to see if it's malicious. So anyway, uh, that's the problem, the supply chain problems. People are very worried about it now, and there is no simple answer. Well, you have a bunch of software that came from other people, and you're installing a bunch of updates that came from other people, and you're just trusting those people. And there really doesn't seem to be any real alternative to trusting those people. Anyway. So B2 is here. Back in the days of Windows 95, there was a huge argument about this. In the days of MS-DOS, people said, I don't want anything on my machine except what I put on there. No automatic updates, nothing. Then I can trust it. But when we've switched to having automatic Windows updates and automatic software updates, we lost all that. Now you're just trusting all these people not to hose you. And what can you do? <laughs> Yes. And I don't know why people do get upset about that. No, I'm, I remember there was some, FBI took down some botnets by pushing out repairs to machines. Um, there were a couple of cases like that, and they had to go get a court order authorizing them to do that because otherwise it would be illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the government has, in fact, pushed updates without you knowing it to fix problems on machines. 
just like Amazon has reached onto people's Kindles and pulled back books. So that's the thing. When your machine is connected to the cloud, other people can mess with it, and they do sometimes. Um, and you know, if they're going to do something like that, they need to have it in the terms of service or court order or something. Hopefully. All right, let's see. You got any chance of getting somebody else? They might. All right, let's see. Otherwise, we... Aha, good. All right. All right, so the command line utility. Yep, SC, service control. All right, which one will cause malware to launch whenever a program that draws windows starts? That's the app and it builds, anything that uses user 32. As long as you're not using secure boot. So what about the Yahoo toolbar, boy? <laughs> I don't know if anybody still uses that thing. Yeah, that was a browser helper object, so-called. All right. And which one is explorer.exe? Yeah, that's the logon shell. All right. So. All right. Well, it's about 10 minutes to 7. Let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll do the last bit of this. All right. And I'll demonstrate the uh, another uh, Velociraptor project. <laughs>